for coming this morning. The, the, as Michael said, this is the, the third year that we've done this now, and um, what we have started to, to kind of figure out is, is as the, the, the wall has kind of started to come down, so to speak, in terms of us actually talking about what we do at ZIP in terms of a, a design technology and a philosophy. Obviously, there are a lot of people out here that want to know about it. So uh, again, thanks for coming, and, and um, hopefully you will uh, get some interesting stuff out of this. Um, sorry, thanks. Um, within this whole industry now, there's, there's, there's a really fine line between fashion and function. And we, we want to make it pretty clear that from a zip standpoint, we have both feet planted pretty firmly on the function side. And I think what we're going to show you today, as far as aerodynamics, we're not just going to sit here and show you guys a bunch of slides and say, look, we're the fastest, look, we did this. We're going to show you why we design products, how we design products, and ultimately, you know, from you know, like a, a Jordan Rapp perspective, how as an athlete they perform under you and ultimately make you better, make you faster, make you more efficient. Um, please hold questions till the end because we do have a lot of information that we want to get in front of you. I know you're gonna, you will have questions. If you don't have questions, there's something wrong. Um, so hold your questions till the end. We do have Q and A at the end, and we do have some handouts um, that that these guys will talk about a bit. Uh, for people that are really interested in your head's not completely blown up in this. So I'm going to hand it off to Josh first. And um, you know, again, thanks for coming and hopefully you guys enjoy this. It's good stuff. All right. As Michael David said, I'm Josh Porter's technical director of Speedbuck. Can you speak up just a little bit, please? Okay. So, Really excited. We're showing some stuff today that we've never shown before. Um, some interesting technologies behind the technologies. I want to open by saying, you know, 20 months ago, we, Michael and I stood in front of a, a, the media in Amsterdam for the 404 Firecrest Carbon Culture Launch, and we had what we we had what we believed to be a truly revolutionary technology. And looking back. Over these past 20 months, it, it seems that the, the things we talked about that day, the technologies we launched, have completely changed the way people talk about wheels. We have changed the discussion. We launched Firecrest, the first rim shape that focused on handling. We used the word stability. You'll notice every single wheel manufacturer uh, that you talk to at the show today will probably use the word stability. 20, 20 months ago, that nobody talked about that. We, really revolutionized the way we think about wheels, about efficiency, about economy from the rider's perspective. And we've completely changed the way we develop the product to make it not only faster, but better handling, more economical, more comfortable. So a slide that I often use when I do these do presentations is this one and put it up and say, can anyone tell me what this is a graph of <laughs> against time? So we've got years on the bottom. Some of you have seen it. Yes, it, this is the hour record. People ask all the time, why aero? Why do you guys focus so much attention on aerodynamics? This slide says it all. Let's look. This is 130 years of the hour record. And when you start looking at milestones, 68, Eddie Merckx. There's a picture of the cannibal in that attempt. Just under 50 kilometers an hour. Moser, disc wheels, 84, pushes the record up pretty significantly. In the whole 1995, 6-7 era, Obrey, Boardman, back and forth, massive technological development. Look at the position, the bike, the helmet. Superman position, some of the most radical bikes ever. We push it up 57 kilometers an hour, and the UCI steps in, and what do they do? They take away the aero technology. Where do we end up? Boardman, same guy, the same guy, seven kilometers in an hour. How's this compared to Merckx? Boardman, with his mildly bobtailed aero helmet and skin suit, beats Merckx by 11 meters. So that's 30 years of technology, bearings, steel frames, training, uh, the whole methodology behind the approach to the hour record netted us 11 meters, yet all the aero technology before that netted us 7 kilometers. So just a good one to really put it into perspective. Why is aero important? 
That's why errors are important. So I hand over to Michael. Thanks, Josh. Okay, so our mission at ZIP is to make you faster through technology. That's something that we've done since the beginning of our company and something we continue to, to do today. So the question is, why do we focus so much on aero? Josh just kind of went through that. It's because most of your power is lost through aerodynamic losses. And we all know speed is fun. The faster you go, the more fun you have. So that's why we do it. Okay, so what I'm gonna show here is basically what we're gonna talk about today. We're gonna take you through a lot of information, but basically we're gonna start off with what are our key design considerations when we develop a new product. We're gonna talk a little bit about the advancement in computer simulations, a lot of stuff we're doing there, really interesting stuff. And then we're gonna close with, uh, with real world athlete feedback on the product and, and to give you, you know, we're just trying to close the loop. So, our philosophy. Basically, we believe that we are a technology company. Everything that we do is, it, was, it started as a technology, and then we roll it into a product. Uh, we're a company first. Um, since, since we started over 25 years ago, basically, we've been at the leading edge of a lot of different developments. Disc, uh, composite disc, cr composite cranks, composite rims. Uh, got a new technology there, stitching that we're really proud of. We're technology leader, so so when we develop new product, um, you know, some people think we're just about efficiency. Well, we as engineers, when we develop product, we have to, have to consider lots of different things, and this is just kind of a a circle of different things that we can do um, to overall improve the, the the handling of the bike, improve the uh, what the rider feels, and this is this is a circle that we kind of go to and, and we pick out traits that we wanted to maximize, minimize, and optimize, and then we go from there. So, one thing to remember that. We always try to develop a balanced product. Um, like I said, we're not just about efficiency. Um, we're about optimization and making a balanced product. Just gonna roll through some technologies that we've developed over the years that, that really come out in our products. And what you'll see is, what I call this, this graph here, this is what I say is, like a natural progression of a technology company. You can see where our technologies come from. A lot of times, you may not understand it, but if you look at our product history, you can see over time, over the last 10, 15 years, we're steadily, steadily making improvements, and this is our kind of technology that we're proud of. Michael, if, if, if I could too. What, what's important to recognize is, is each of these technologies tend to leapfrog up and over and off of each other. I mean, and what, what's relevant about this, again, is, is the history. I mean, you've got to go back about 23 years now to where it all started, or we wouldn't be where we are today. I mean, if we had shown up with press technology 21 years ago, it would have been kind of like the carbon cranks in 96 when people said, you're nuts, nobody's going to ride them. And guess what? They didn't. Now, it's standard, it's standard technology. I mean, a carbon crank on a high-end bike, if it's not there, you're saying, what's wrong, why? So it's important to recognize the historical influence of all these factors. So, in saying that, um, like I said, this is our technology graph here, um, but at some, time, at some point in time, you kind of have to shoot the engineer, because the engineer will kind of make a science project you know, out of developed technologies. And at some point, you actually have to develop product. And this just kind of shows product that we've developed over the years and kind of where it fits in that technology graph. Um, and their most recent product is the, the 303s, um, 303 Firecrest. So, all those technologies are on the outside, and they're pretty easy to see, they're pretty easy to copy, um, but what, what's more, much more difficult to copy is the knowledge behind why we're doing certain things. To us, that is the key to our success. 
Okay, so where are we going? We're going in a direction to more computer simulation because the computers are getting much, much better at handling the, uh, the complex problems that, that we're trying to solve today. And we're going into this realm of CFD and kind of beyond the wind tunnel, beyond drag. I'm gonna turn it back over to Josh. All right, as, as Michael pointed out, the, the mission through CFD, which we'll uh, show you here in a minute, is to go beyond drag. So a few years back, we realized that we had diminishing returns on our wind tunnel dollars. We, we spend more money in wind tunnel every year than any other company in this industry. And yet we were finding that every uh, subsequent wind tunnel test was yielding smaller and smaller gains in drag. We were kind of approaching a, a floor of drag. And the thought was, you know, there may be a minimum here, and you know, it, we may be at the minimum drag we can achieve. But there's other things, there's more to aero than just drag. And through the use of CFD, we can take what we learn at the wind tunnel, which is the, the what. The wind tunnel will tell you what the data is. The data is X or Y or Z. The wind tunnel doesn't explain why. CFD, when done properly, can really help with the understanding of why. And so we've taken an incredibly deep dive into the CFD technology and invested heavily to understand why. And in doing that, we've been able to break through some of these barriers, including what we thought was the theoretical drag floor. We thought the, the, the line we could not go beneath. Uh, we found that we could actually go beneath it quite significantly. CFD stands for Computational Fluid Dynamics. It's often referred to as the virtual wind tunnel. It's basically a, a powerful mathematical tool for predicting flow behavior. Just real quickly. It, it's very important to note, that, like Josh just said, you know, that, that theoretical aero floor being able to get there. We have ways right now today where we could make you know, the AOA Firecrest arguably the fastest spoke wheel on the market faster than it is. But going back to Michael's note about the whole cyclical, the, the wheel as a whole, everything is a balance. And if we rob from one to give to another, say aero, we may be damaging durability, we may be damaging stability, we may be, you know, you know what I mean? So everything is a balance, so by being able to tie it all together here and keeping that balance, it's really important to know. So, behind all these pretty pictures, and they wouldn't, I had a slide that had all the equations that uh, need to be solved to, to make these models, and nobody wanted to see that slide because it's really ugly. Um, the steady state solution, 3.6 gigabytes of data per solution. The dynamic solution, the video in the previous slide, and, and some things we'll show you here, but 1.2 terabytes per solution. What's important here is it's really just within the last three or four years that we have won the, the solvers, the actual uh, equations and algorithms to solve these problems for unsteady state flow. And really in the last two to three years that we've had the computing power affordable enough to actually do it through, through cloud computing. I mean, this, this is pretty revolutionary stuff, and this is computing power, uh, computer power, and mathematical formulas catching up and allowing us to push our technology further and further ahead. So, a little history. 2009, uh, we were at MIT at the AIAA conference, which is a uh, aeronautics and astronomics conference, and we saw a paper by some guys who had solved this rotational translational flow problem. This is a very hard problem to solve in CFD. These guys, you can see some of their examples. Uh, they work with those guys you may have heard of at NASA on that, that space shuttle thing. Uh, they do a lot of wind turbine solutions. The far right, that's a V-22 Osprey rotor. These guys could solve the Osprey rotor problem, rotational translational flight. This was huge. So, we met up with them and said, we, we want to work with you guys. Because, you know, there, I think there's 15 PhDs at Fieldview. The, the head guy presenting the paper happens to be a cyclist. He has three PhDs. Um, he's a fairly intelligent guy. And, and so we hook up and we realize that these guys have the solution that we need. So we put together a working relationship that's broken into three parts. And this is where I get most excited. 
we have Zip working with the software to solve Zip problems. How do we make faster wheels? How do we solve stability? How do we learn? We have the Intelligent Light, the owner of FieldView, doing their proprietary thing. How do we push these solutions further ahead? And, and then we agreed that we would take a third piece of the pie for public domain. And out of that, we published three papers in the public domain on bicycle wheel CFD, rotational translational combined CFD, the math, uh, the things that need to happen in the solver to make this work. Uh, and we've actually won two awards at the AIAA for work in advancing the field of CFD. So this is a really important component. You know, a lot of people come at these conferences and say, aren't you guys just teaching your competitors what to do? And I think as Michael pointed out, it's, it's easy to imitate, but you can see what you think we're doing, but you don't know what we're actually doing. And so we're, we're, I, I, we're thrilled that we can advance science through CFD, but we're, we're not telling quite everything. That's why you're changing slides too. Guys, what do, you, what do you mean when he says translation? I, I'm, I'm not the engineer, so I'll bring it back to real world. Um, what he means when he says translational and rotational, which is why it's so difficult. Translational is just something moving through air on its own. Rotational means it's spinning at the same time. So being able to solve those two together is what's so difficult. If you think about everything else, airplane propeller, it spins, but if those blades were spinning at the same time relative, now you see it gets a lot more complicated. Real world. And the, the, the beauty of the bicycle wheel from the CFD company's perspective is th this is the hardest problem to solve in fluid flow right now. It, it seems simple. Oh, it's a bicycle wheel. That's pretty straightforward. But the CFD guys, the, you know, NASA level guys have come up to us and said, wow, that, you know, this is amazing. This is a hard problem. You know, space shuttle is a fairly simple problem to solve relative to bicycle wheel in CFD terms. Right? Because it's just trans, it just flies. We can solve planes. Okay? We can solve wings. Um, th there's other aspects of space shuttle that make it really difficult to solve that we won't get into. But for, for, for all intents and purposes, that's not that hard a problem to solve compared to this. And uh, so, so that's where it's really a, a perfect marriage between our companies. So if used properly and, and really understood, CFD can enhance the knowledge. This is a, a, a plot of the side force on a wheel, zero yaw in the darker colors out to red at 20 degrees yaw. This is telling us the, the why. This is what the wind tunnel is giving you as a data point. CFD is giving you as an idea of what's really happening. So how does it work? So we take a model, this is a good close-up picture. The model is essentially computer wrapped in a mesh of polygons. So in this case, they're all triangles for the next one. <coughs> Here's another example of a wheel and a fork and a frame. Um, these are hexes. We use tetrahedrals, tri triangles, uh, hexes. Every single hex here has six corners. Every corner is a node. Every node is solved through a massive set of equations in three dimensions, and hence the data problem. So th this solution here was 12.8 million nodes. Each node solved three equations, each solved in three dimensions. This is, this is where the technology is important. You can't do this by hand. Uh, here's a close-up of, of the mesh. So th this, this is exciting stuff. We, three years ago, this was not possible. All right, so what did we learn? And we're still learning. <laughs> what we learned was the definition of stability, something that we we had an idea about, but we really believed from the wind tunnel that stability was tied to side force. The higher the side force, the higher the torque on the wheel. That's what the wind tunnel was telling us. So there was kind of an acceptance. Well, deeper wheels have more side force, more side force is more torque. Those wheels are harder to ride. That's a really simplified version of things, but we, we thought we were pretty smart with that understanding. I mean, there's a lot of people who didn't even have that understanding. But what CFD helped us understand was that we could, through rim shape, minimize the side force. An 80 millimeter rim can have less side force than another 80 millimeter rim. We, we didn't really get that until we could see it in CFD and manipulate through. We realized that there's a thing called center of pressure here, the CP. 
the center of pressure is basically the center of where all those side forces are acting. We learned with CFD that we could move that around. And by moving the, CF, the center of pressure relative to the steering axis, we could change the torque. Th this was huge. This was, you know, I still think back to these meetings we had where we, we all of a sudden had what we like to call the burden of knowledge. The, the moment of going, guys, we, we just learned something that nobody knew or thought about or had ever modeled or predicted or talked about before. But now the burden's on us to figure out what to do with it, right? There's, there's no handbook. Oh, let's, let's open the handbook and see where do we move the center of pressure. This is, we broke ground and we created the science and now the burden was on us to figure out well, what, what do you do? What's good? How do, we make, how do we make sure that we're not doing something that's worse? And then most excitingly, and this was, we began to learn this in 09 and in 2010, we really could accurately model a phenomenon called vortex shedding. And this is probably the most exciting piece here. This is transient periodic flow. Uh, this is very, very complex stuff. The simplified version is if you've ever driven an old car with a round antenna on the hood, you will notice that at some speed that antenna goes sideways like this. And in your mind, yeah, 50 miles an hour, right? That thing should be leaned back in the wind, but it's sitting there and it's just going sideways. That's vortex shedding. Little vortices are tripping off one side and the other, and you're losing all this energy waving that antenna sideways. It, it, it's still bent back. It still has the drag that it would have, plus it's also shedding huge amounts of energy as it vibrates. We've been able to map and understand this phenomenon. So our first goal, minimize side force. With the software, we could manipulate models and actually see changes in side force from one model to the other without ever getting into a prototype. You know, we, we were the first guys to use advanced plastic prototypes in the wind tunnel all the way back in 2000, which is technology that we just brought from the auto racing industry. And those are great. The plastic prototype is six, seven thousand dollars, right? That's relatively cheap compared to you know, trying to cut a mold or, or carve something in wood or some of the older techniques. But still pretty expensive. And then you have to take it to the wind tunnel and test it, and that's not cheap. Well here, this isn't cheap either, but we can run through many, many more iterations, but we can also begin to get the why. Look at these graphs. You see a 1080 versus uh, an old 404. That's not just a huge change in the magnitude of side force, but look at how it's distributed. Those wheels handle very differently, and in, right in there is the reason why. And again, kind of back to a, a, a real world perspective, what he's talking about when he talks about steering torque or input or what you're looking at, when you're riding the bike and you guys get a wind gust, I mean, the whole, your whole system's not moving over. You're feeling the handlebar whipping back and forth in your hands. That's steering input. That's torque. And so the side forces that you're looking at, ultimately, where they are positioned is going to determine how much that wheel whips around in your hands versus just the whole system moving side to side, right? Okay, this is a great demonstration that we, we use in shops and will help those of you who are shop owners. This is the simple way to think of it. Side force, okay, force is just pushing. If I push on him like this, he can resist that pretty easily, right? There's, ba there's balance. He knows where he's pushing, okay? This is center of pressure in the center of, of the system, and I can put some side force, and I can lean on him pretty hard. But when the center of pressure moves somewhere else, if the center of pressure were here, and I push just as hard, he can't do much to resist that, right? This is pretty easy to overcome. This is not. That's what moving the center of pressure does. We're, the goal has become to take this and make it that. That's a great, that's a great one for explaining this to your customers uh, and to athletes. Because it, really, that, that's what's happening at, at the front wheel of the bike. <laughs> Anyone who's ever ridden a deep section wheel on a gusty day knows what it feels like when that handlebar's whipped around in your hands. And you have that kind of quick pucker up moment where, you know, am I going to ride this out or am I going to have to correct it? If you don't have to correct it, you just ride through it. it saves energy, goes faster, all those things. Quick slide showing you. Yeah, the location, the, the key thing from that slide was the, the steering axis of the bicycle is behind the hub. 
And so that was one of the huge issues we had to figure out was, do you want the center pressure at the hub? Do you want it near the steering axis? Is it better to be in front or behind? Um, so 09, we solved that problem. And by 2010, we we're solving the transient behavior of the wheel. And this is where we really get our minds blown and really took a step back. And I always <coughs> describe this, this was like, you know, getting kicked between the legs when we first ran these numbers. Every wind tunnel test we've ever been to, between us, we have over a thousand hours in the tunnel. Every wind tunnel study we've ever done starts with a simple plan. And that's, how are we gonna create the data points? And right in there, we sealed our fate by using the word point. Well, we're gonna take a 30 second snip of data and we're gonna, at 100 hertz, 100 samples per second, and we're gonna average that to a point. And when we started running these simulations, we realized in choosing to, to assume that it's a point, we were missing the fact that there's a data range. The plots are changing over time. This is a uh, center of pressure on an old 404. The center of pressure is moving. It's not a point, it's a range. So this, we pretty quickly tied to the phenomenon that the writers would refer to as buffeting. You know, an instability in the wheel, it doesn't feel stable under you. It, it seems to kind of be tracking uh, under its own mind. So the plots are changing. Well, why are they changing, right? So now we've, we've learned this, okay, they're changing, that's not good. So we, we take this, this visualization is exactly the same model we just showed you, but with a different visualization technique. These are particles being deposited right in front of the wheel. And what you see is that the particles are stacking up and shedding off in waves. This is vortex shedding. This is exactly the same phenomenon that's making the car antenna go like this. Okay, this, this phenomenon is all around you. Look at high-rise buildings. Uh, most people in this room have probably gone to the Taipei trade show at least once. You have the Taipei 101 tower. The shape of that building is specifically engineered to stop vortex shedding. You have a building that tall, if it wants to pick up a harmonic and vibrate in the wind, it will knock itself over. So everyone who's been to engineering school has seen the great Tacoma Narrows Bridge. It's the bridge with the wind on it. Yeah, it's the wind. And the bridge just keeps dancing and dancing, and eventually it shakes itself apart. That's this problem. And unfortunately for those guys back in the 50s, they had no idea. So, hey Josh, let me add something. So what we've talked about just in these series of slides is we've talked about the three basics of stability. The first being you want to minimize the magnitude of that side force. You want to minimize the force that, that's acting in the in the in the direction that's you know pushing you off the road. The second thing is we want to minimize the movement of that center of pressure relative to yaw angle. So that last slide was showing different yaw angles and how that center of pressure was moving relative to yaw angle. And the third part of stability that's super important is what you want to do here is you want to maximize, or what you want to do is you want to increase the, the shedding frequency and decrease its amplitude. Because the worst scenario is you have a really low amplitude, or really high amplitude, or yeah, high amplitude, low frequency, and you get a large buildup of these particles, and you, it sheds all at once, right? And once it sheds, it's a big movement. You lost a lot of energy. So what you really want is a high frequency, low amplitude shed. So what you want it to do is like this, rather than dump all at once. So that's just kind of the summary of what we just went through there, which is big. And in the statement he just made, he, it took us about six months to figure that out, right? We're back to our burden of knowledge problem. Where we said, okay, we're vortex shedding, but what, do, what should it be? You know, what, what's good? And we did a lot of science study. We've got some papers up here, actually a 2010 AIAA award-winning paper, uh, where we actually studied traditional wheels, wheels that are known to handle poorly and wheels that were known to handle well, to try to understand what you want to do with it, because there's no handbook on this. So. How does this compare to wind tunnel? This is, and we, we haven't shown these before, because they're, they're easy to confuse with drag plots, but this is a steering torque plot relative to yaw. And the idea is that, just like a drag curve, you've got yaw angle at the bottom, but here, instead of drag, this is your wind-induced yaw torque. So this is how much 
torque the wind is putting into the wheel. And of course that torque is the combination of center of pressure and side force. It's a force acting on a distance. So think of it as a torque wrench. Right? The longer the torque wrench we give the wind, the higher these numbers are from zero. The shorter the torque wrench, the closer to zero. This is actual data from the wind tunnel of some pretty common wheels, 404, 808, a three-spoke. Um, and what you see is the points are our old thinking. When you take away the data point and you look at the actual variation in the data you have, you see that that's not a point at all. That's the range we were talking about. So that 0.3 newtons isn't 0.3 newtons. It's 0.3 plus or minus 0.05 or some large number. That is the buffeting force. So torque is how much, or the wind-induced torque level is how much torque it has over you. But then within that, there can be large variations. That's buffeting. You see some of these wheels, the orange one, that's a concave uh, sidewall 45 millimeter V-shaped rim which is quite interesting in that it, it has variation that's almost as large as its magnitude. This is a wheel that we, talking to pro athletes, was highlighted as probably the most difficult wheel any of them had ever ridden. And we heard this consistently. So we bought one, we wind tunneled it, we tested it, we CFD modeled it, we completely closed the loop in understanding that behavior. And what we found was it has not only some of the largest torque, or in, in negative torque, which is the direction you don't want, but uh, it had the largest variation per data point, which means it has the largest shedding. So getting to the Firecrest solution after a year of this is, is what, do you, what do we want to do? What can we do and what's possible in collapsing um, the variation and minimizing the torque? And this is pretty exciting. This is 404 toroidal, the rim we were selling up until about two years ago data points with its modeled variation. And in orange, you have 404 Firecrest. This is a rim of the same depth. So what you see is that by moving the center of pressure and designing and optimizing the shape to increase the shedding frequency, we've made a wheel that is considerably easier to handle. And the best part is we can now, in the computer, with the math, tell that that's going to be an easy to handle wheel before we have to make prototypes out of it. Now, behind this is we had to make structural prototypes and develop entirely new methodologies for prototyping and making plastic prototypes that were rideable, which is a whole other huge technology development. Um, a lot of learning went on there. Now we can trust our models. You see with 303, our latest Firecrest uh, technology, we have considerably lower torque still and lower variation still. And this is how we're able to consistently use the technology to drive better product. So I'm going to bring Jordan in, the, bring Jordan up now to talk. The, the key here, what, what we're after, we said at the beginning, going fast is fun. And going fast and being comfortable on your bike and not feeling like you're going to die in a crosswind, that's fun. And having a wheel that you don't choose to leave in your car on the day of your event, that's, that's value in that wheel, right? And that's fun, because you can go fast and feel that that expensive wheel you purchased was, in fact, a good purchase, um, which is not the case when it sits in your trunk for your A event. It, and then ultimately, what we like to call the economy of stability, that through this, we make this guy go faster. I think that you know all of the engineering stuff is incredibly fascinating to me, but when I get out and race, I don't really care what is the most aerodynamic wheel, or what is the most stable wheel, or what is the strongest wheel. I just want to know what the fastest wheel is. And I think that gets back to that sense of, of optimization. You know, I used to travel with an 808 and a 1080 front, and I would make a judgment call sort of based off pre-riding the course, which wheel I was going to ride. And I knew that the 1080 is a more aerodynamic wheel, but that didn't always result in it being a faster wheel on the day. Um, and I would leave that wheel in the car a lot of times and people would say, isn't that wheel faster? And I would say, no, that wheel's more aerodynamic, but it's more difficult to handle. And sometimes that difficulty in handling will actually make it, you know, I think a slower wheel because I come out of the aero bars, you know, more often, you know, or I just, I'm more tired just from controlling this wheel shaking. You know, you think in that last sort of, that, that home stretch coming in, you know, there's a very real 
sort of amount of fatigue of just steering your bike. And I think that if you're more comfortable and, and just able to sort of sit in that position, that you're going to be faster. And that's, I mean, faster is faster, right? You know, more stable wheels and faster, a more aerodynamic wheels and faster. It's all of those things together that make a wheel itself faster. You know, and it might not be the wheel, it's sort of, it's just that the, whatever the wheel offers makes you faster. And, you know, I think that's a huge thing in seeing that it's not just the wheels, it's how the wheels interact with the bike. And being able to be a part of this whole system, you know, where it's not just the, the wheel itself, it's the wheel and the tire, and then the wheel and the tire and the bike. And then actually with something like stability, it's the wheel and the tire and the bike and a physical rider. It's, a, it's me, it's a person. And then at the end of the day, all of these things come together to make me faster, not through any one thing, but through everything together. And that's really the huge advantage at the end of the day. I'm faster because of everything, not because of one thing. So that's it. That's what we have. Um, and again, I, it, this was not this was not a forum where we thought we're going to put up a bunch of wind tunnel graphs and say, you know, look, we're the fastest. I mean, all of you guys, whether you're dealers or coaches or, or consumers or, or media or whoever, probably all still ride your bike, right? And again, at the end of the day, when you go out on your bike, you want to go fast, you want to have fun, and, and you want to feel like you're improving and, and, and moving forward. We're doing the same thing with our products. And again, it's, it's important to recognize that it's a whole cyclical balance, and it all has to work together or none of it works. So um, we're gonna we're gonna move on. Um, I'm gonna give it back to, to Michael here to, to keep the show moving. Um, we are available for questions afterwards. And uh, as Josh, when, when Josh talked about the pie up there with the public domain content, we actually have some printouts if if any of you guys want to want to dig into it a little bit further. So come see us afterwards. Thanks a lot, Reb. All right, we're gonna quickly.